And a very pleasant good evening to you on this Tuesday night. I'm Jamie Costello, news anchor with WMAR-TV, a moderator for tonight's great event. And we are going to have an important discussion tonight on the environment and the issues that are impacting us every single day here in our great state of Maryland. And uh, I would like to acknowledge the Maryland uh, Catholic Conference, which organized tonight's virtual discussion. They are always trying to elevate the important issues that we face here on our block, on our streets, on our fields. And I'd just like to send a great thank you out to them. The conference, which represents the three Catholic dioceses here in Maryland, which have been long committed, long committed to advancing the church's teaching on the environment. And it's pleased to welcome tonight's panelists. And we are led by Senator Jill Carter. Senator, how are you? And also we have Delegate Benjamin Brooks. It's all great to be on the same block right here. We just have to go outside our window here and see. And we are joined by Miss Robin Clark from the Chesapeake Bay uh, Foundation, Professor Russell Dickerson, who sits on the Maryland Commission on Climate Change, and Mr. Chris Beecraft of Underwood and Associates. And finally, the Archbishop, Archbishop William Lorry, who is joining us here, Archbishop of Baltimore and Chair of the Maryland Catholic Conference. Thank you to you all. And before we proceed with our important discussion here tonight, I would like to invite Father Ray Harris, pastor of Holy Family Catholic Church here in Randallstown, to offer our opening prayer. Father? Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Let us pray. Oh, God, you have declared everything that you have created to be good, including human beings whom you have created in your image. Help us to offer our thanksgiving for this gift by serving as good stewards of your creation. As we consider the challenges and opportunities before us, encourage us to resist any temptation to promote self-interest. Inspire us to care for one another and our communities in concrete ways. Empower us to resolve to work together for the common good, to provide for what is just. And by doing so, may we give glory to you who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Father Harris, thank you so much. Uh, you know, with Black History Month, uh, Father Harris, I don't know if you know this, but when he was training at All Saints here in Baltimore, he was under the tutelage of Father Daniel, uh, D Donald Sterling, who was the first ordained priest here in Baltimore, first black ordained priest here in Baltimore. And he's been serving at uh, Holy Holy Family Catholic Church here for a number of years, 145 years in, Ball in Randallstown, by the way, that church is. All right, now each panelist will be asked to offer a brief opening statement and followed up by some opportunity for a little discussion and responses or pre-submitted questions. And if you're watching us in the audience here on YouTube and also on Facebook, you too can submit your questions here. All you have to do is communicate with us, email at uh, communications at mdcatholic.org, and we'll try to get to uh, many of these questions as we can possibly fit in here tonight. Now let's meet the panel, and they are a distinguished one. We start off with Western's Best. Jill Carter, our delegate here who represents the 41st, the senator who represents the 41st district. She has been an outspoken advocate for environmental justice, committed to holding accountable those responsible for lead poisoning, water pollution, air toxins, and for advancing legislation that moves our state toward 100% clean energy usage and fossil fuel independence. And Senator Carter has been a member of the Senate since 2018 and serves on a number of committees, including the Judicial Proceedings Committee. She is also a member of the Legislative Black Caucus. And Senator Carter, thank you so much for joining us here tonight. And I invite you to open up your remarks, Senator. Thank you for the introduction. We do not inherit the earth from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. Thank you, Archbishop Lori and the Catholic Conference. Thanks for including me in this important discussion to talk about the most pressing issue of our generation, climate change. As we consider and debate over hundreds of bills this session, I often think nothing we do here will matter 
if we do not have a planet on which to live. Being able to breathe quality air, drink lead-free water, and live in lead-free housing, walk in open green spaces, and swim in the ocean are human rights. Environmental justice is equity. I look forward to talking with you tonight and the work that we can do to change the direction of our world, especially ensuring environmental health as a human right. All right, Senator, thank you so much for your opening remarks and uh, joining her on the front lines, of course, in the legislation. Uh, our new panelist here, our next one is Delegate Benjamin Brooks. Here he comes. He represents the 10th District. He has been outspoken advocate for environmental justice since he got to Annapolis. And Delegate Brooks is calling for legislation that is, of course, committed to dynamic solutions to issues that impact natural resources, including pollution, energy production, and conversion. And Delegate Brooks has been a member of the House of Delegates since 2015 and serves on the Economic Matters Committee and is also a member of the Legislative Black Caucus. Delegate Brooks, thank you so much for joining us here tonight. Your opening remarks, sir. Okay, sorry about that. Thanks, Jamie, for the introduction. Um, uh, uh, Arsit Bishop Laurie, uh, my, my colleague, Senator Carter, and other panelists, it certainly is a pleasure to be here. Uh, for the record, again, I'm, I'm Delegate Brooks, and I, uh, I, uh, I represent the 10th Legislative District in, in Baltimore County. And my district office is on Liberty Road, <laughs> uh, which, which the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the Holy uh, Church is right there as well. Yeah, yeah. But um, why should we protect the environment? Well, my short answer would be this. Well, the, the grass is greener, the air is cleaner, the water is clearer, and the people are there, you know, that's a short answer. But the long answer is to enhance human health, you know, to, to protect our ecosystem, you know, to protect our natural resources, to combat climate change, to foster economic growth, and to pave the way for future generations. That's what we should do. And I, we can, as we go further into the program, uh, I'll go into greater details about this. And one other thing as well, I, I chair the Public Utilities Subcommittee. So a lot of the bills that, that has to deal with the environment will be coming before for my committee. All right, Delegate Brooks, thank you so much, sir. Now, our second panelist this evening is Professor Russell Dickerson of the University of Maryland's Department of Atmospheric and Oceanic Science. He heads the Regional Atmospheric Measurement, Modeling and Prediction Program and of the Maryland Commission on Climate Change. And Professor Dickerson, we thank you for your presence here. You may be the smartest man in the room here tonight. Go ahead. <laughs> I, yeah, I sincerely doubt that. Uh, reminds me of something that uh, John Kennedy said, uh, perhaps the smartest man except when uh, Tom Jefferson slept here. So thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to talk about the environment. Uh, I am indeed a professor and a member of the Climate Change Commission, uh, a commissioner, but I'm an employee of the state of Maryland and therefore see this as a duty to do service work to the state of uh, Maryland. So uh, let me start off by saying I do not speak for either the Maryland uh, Department of the Environment or the University of Maryland. These are my opinions. Uh, and I'll start with an opening statement that climate change has been referred to as an existential problem, meaning our very existence depends on maintaining the climate. So the threats of global warming are to all mankind and every living thing on the planet. Uh, I worry the earth cannot maintain anything like its natural state if we have 10 billion people on the planet. Uh, which is what's forecast. The University of Maryland has for decades worked with the Maryland Department of the Environment to uh, try to provide policy relevant science. And this plan of using policy based on the best available science has been remarkably successful. Our children are no longer threatened with lead or carbon monoxide uh, the way we were as children. Uh, acid rain has basically been neutralized. 
which is what's forecast. But there are miles to go before we sleep. So I can quote uh, The Lancet, a medical journal. Diseases caused by pollution were responsible for an estimated 9 million premature deaths in 2015, 16% of all deaths worldwide, three times more deaths than from AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria combined, 15 times more from all wars and other forms of violence. So the problem is both local and global. And uh, to take something from Rachel Carson's book, man can hardly even recognize the devils of his own creation. Professor, we thank you so much. And again, we have just joined, if you just joined us here, we've been on for about 10 minutes. Again, you can chat with us on YouTube, your Facebook, or email us here if you have a question about what we are facing as a state, as a country, as a world. We want to bring in our next panelist right now, Ms. Robin Clark of the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, one of the oldest and most visible uh, defenders of the environment here in, in Maryland. And the foundation was founded back in 1967 and it's the largest conservation organization dedicated solely to saving our bay. And its motto, of course, has always been save the bay. It's a regional rallying cry for our politicians and our pollution trying to reduction uh, throughout the Chesapeake six state, 64,000 square mile watershed, which is home to more than 18 million people and 3,000 species of plants and animals. And Ms. Clark, thank you so much for joining us here tonight. And thank you so much for everything you do for our Chesapeake Bay. It means a lot to you, doesn't it? Absolutely. Thank you so much for the opportunity to participate with this esteemed panel. Um, it's wonderful to be alongside the, the delegate and the senator, and thank you to Archbishop Lori for hosting us. Um, I'll just make a few remarks this, this evening to, to start out. We've got an exciting General Assembly session before us this year. Um, I think the themes of the, of the session for me are really partnership and working across a very diverse subject matter of legislation in order to um, work on the protection and restoration of the Chesapeake Bay. But every piece that we do is, is very much tied in to climate change, um, the topic of the hour. This just today, we had the hearing um, of the Senate's Climate Change uh, Omnibus Legislation Climate Solutions Now Act. And there was a wonderful rally preceding the hearing where Robin Lewis of the Interfaith Power and Light really stole the show um, with a rallying cry to, to pass climate legislation this year before it's um, much too late. So we're proud to be among many partners pushing for comprehensive climate legislation this year. And we're also very watchful of the opportunities this year for funding across a diverse um, range of environmental initiatives because of the strong budget picture we have at the state level and the potential for federal funds coming down. But thanks for the opportunity to be here and look, look forward to speaking more uh, in detail about the legislation further in the conversation. All right, Robin, thank you so much. Save the Bay. Uh, we wanna thank her so much. And now our next panelist is Mr. Chris Chris, there you are, Chris B. Kraft, who represents Underwood and Associates in Annapolis, and it's a firm that is committed to developing methods and techniques to restore and reintegrate watershed ecosystems on behalf of Maryland's clients since 1990. And the company is considered a leader in research, development, education, and construction of sand seepage wetlands, integrated streams and wetlands, and regenerative stream channel and also coastal plain outfall systems. And Mr. Beecraft, we invite you in. That's a lot that your company does and does so well. Tell us more, will you? Sure, and, and I first wanna start off by, uh, by thanking everybody for having me. Uh, being a part of this group is, is something special and, and I'm glad you know myself and our company uh, can be involved in the effort. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, my name is Chris. Uh, I'm with Underwood and Associates. We're an ecosystem restoration company based out of Annapolis. We work uh, in the Chesapeake Bay region, and we work with not specifically the folks on this panel, but a lot of folks like uh, the folks on this panel uh, to get projects not only designed, but ultimately implemented. And our goal is to, to work with legislation, work with policymakers, but also work with local and state jurisdictions uh, to get real world change and physical product in the ground uh, to, to physically restore our bay. 
all, all, all very, very important to the overall water quality, habitat goals, and, and climate resiliency goals, as everybody mentioned earlier uh, in this panel. So I'm looking forward to any of the questions that you guys have, any specific detail questions on, on how to get these projects implemented, how to get them funded, designed, permitted. Uh, they're all very important questions because when the rubber hits the road, uh, there need to be answers. And, and fortunately enough in Maryland and Chesapeake Bay watershed, we've been doing this for a long time. And we really are out in front of a lot of the other states and uh, jurisdictions around the area. So feel free to ask questions and we're here to answer. And, and thanks again for having me. All right, Chris, thank you so much. And our final panelists here tonight, Archbishop William Laurie, the Roman Catholic Archbishop of Baltimore, born in Louisville, Kentucky, back in, whoa, 1951. And he has served as our Archbishop uh, since May of 2012. You're the 16th Archbishop of Baltimore. And during his tenure, he has responded to Pope Francis's call for Catholics to take responsibility for protecting our environment. And what you've done with our Catholic schools is just, uh, it is amazing. You made the Maryland Green Schools, uh, making the parishes and schools engage in environmentally conscious practices such as energy efficient lighting, entering into power purchase agreements, solar, and uh, also transforming unused asphalt lots into green space and the planting of trees. No Archbishop thought about this way before you, and thank you so much for thinking about it now and into the future. Your opening remarks, Archbishop Glory. Uh, Jamie, thank you very much, and I'm uh, honored to be with our distinguished panelists tonight. And uh, I want to thank you and thank all of you but you're, for all that you're doing to protect our beautiful state of Maryland and the quality of life uh, for all of uh, Maryland, Maryland's residents. Thank you so much. And it is a commitment that the church shares with you. Uh, I'd also like to thank the Victory Knoll sisters. Uh, it was their generosity that made this webinar possible tonight. The Maryland Catholic Conference was one of uh, 100 Catholic organizations uh, that received a grant from the Victory Knoll Sisters. And uh, through this grant, these grants, um, these organizations are able to uh, further the message of caring for our common home, our environment. Uh, Pope Francis, of course, wrote a beautiful encyclical on the environment called Laudato Si, on the care of our common home. And uh, he talks to us about the process we need to engage in, in order to go about caring for our common home. And let me quote from what he said. He said, attempts to solve all problems through uniform regulations or technical interventions can lead to overlooking the complexity of local problems, which demand the active participation of all the members of the community. He added new processes taking shape cannot always fit into frameworks imported from the outside. They need to be based in the local culture itself. As life and the world are dynamic realities, so our care for the world must also be flexible and dynamic. Merely technical solutions run the risk of addressing symptoms and not the more serious underlying problems. There is a need to respect the rights of peoples and cultures and to appreciate the, that the development of a social group presupposes an historical process that takes place within a cultural context and demands constant and active involvement of local people from within their proper culture. And he adds, nor can the notion of the quality of life be imposed from without, for quality of life must be understood within the world of symbols and customs proper to each human group. I think what the Pope said captures better than I could um, about the comprehensive approach needed uh, for addressing uh, such a complex and far-reaching uh, challenge. It makes clear that caring for the environment is as much about caring for our common home 
as it is about protecting the dignity of every human person. And this is very, this is fundamental to all that the church believes and teaches. And this is why we remain completely committed to working with our partners to ensure that we do everything possible to bring about environmental justice and to promote personal responsibility in caring for the gift that God has entrusted to us to care for during our lifetimes. Thank you very, very much. All right, Archbishop Laurie. And I remember the first time Baltimore met Archbishop, it was at the Preakness. Remember the alibi breakfast, he opened the prayer up. <laughs> May of 2012, where did the years go? That's crazy. I don't know. <laughs> Zoom in by. <laughs> All right, listen, we are going to be opening up our discussion now. Your questions, you can chat with us on Facebook and also on YouTube, and also you can send us an email here at communications at mdcatholic.org. But the first question of the night, let's bring up Senator Carter. And Senator, we want to ask you, how have the current inequities here in Maryland's environmental laws, how have they really impacted the communities of color? Thank you again for coming back to me on that. And I can tell you, I could talk all night on that. And I know I don't have all night. You know, environmental disparities in Maryland and across this country are the result of systemic injustice in design and implementation of environmental laws, regulations, policies, and programs at all levels, national, state, and local. In Baltimore, asthma-related hospitalization rates are doubled compared to the rest of Maryland and almost three times higher than the United States average. African-Americans are twice as likely to die of asthma than whites right here in Maryland. Three out of five African-American and Hispanic Americans live in communities with toxic waste sites. We know that the significant redlining in Baltimore has tremendously perpetuated environmental injustice. When communities are separated, Green spaces are disproportionately eliminated, forestry is eradicated, and the presence of lead increases exponentially. Investments in the community are stinted. And so it is the history of segregation and redlining that has created the, the conditions that we have now. In order to truly establish environmental justice, we must increase educational opportunities, give a voice to the most impacted communities, hold our elected officials accountable to the truth. Our voices will not be heard if we don't amplify them. And so we must create our own megaphones and we must really allow the people to utilize them. I believe that too often the voices of the most harmed and most oppressed have been ignored um, in the halls of power. All right, Senator, thank you so much. Well, the megaphones were working today on Lawyers Mall, where uh, so many came out, Lawyers Mall, to talk about the climate change. And we want to bring in uh, Delegate Brooks. And, and Delegate, uh, the Maryland General Assembly is considering all of these uh, critical uh, climate legislation. And that's why the people were out there on Lawyers Mall today wanting to get this passed. What are some of the highlights of these initiatives? Okay. And Jamie, th thanks for the question. And I think you know, when, when it comes to protecting the environment, you know, uh, we just got to get people not only motivated, but get them accustomed to and used to. And once we do that, of course, we, 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 we set a path for, for, our, for future generations to participate, and then we can get all of this done. One of the bills that I'm really pleased about, one of my colleagues introduced is House Bill 696, and, and that's Delegate Frazier Haldaldo. And what that bill does, it, it, you know, it sort of requests or, or demand that Maryland, when they purchase uh, transportation equipment, vehicles, buses, that they all be EV. We, we can utilize those, uh, those buses, number one, to transport people, kids to and from school without generating any CO2 emissions because that's the, one of the bigger problems and the other uh, 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 byproduct of, of that is those vehicles can be used for storage, battery storage. As we know that, uh, you know, uh, renewable energy like solar and wind, they're non-dispatchable. When the wind's not blowing or not blowing much, we're not generating a whole bunch of, uh, of, of wind energy. When the sun is not shining, shining, we're not generating a whole bunch of electricity from photovoltaic tape. But 
when it is, we can store that energy. And at night, when the, uh, and in the, uh, when, when the uh, demands are high, then we can draw on that storage to mitigate or reduce the cost. You know, so, so those type of initiatives uh, will, will be very helpful. And, and as you know, Maryland has been a leader when it comes to renewables. And I think we will continue to lead in that path. So, uh, so that, that's just a couple of the, the initiatives that we're, we're planning to make sure that, uh, that we, uh, we meet the goal. And, and historically, I remember back when we were saying we wanted to do 20 percent renewables by 2020, and we moved it up uh, to 25 or 30 percent, or 40 by 2030. You know, so we keep pushing the envelopes, and as we push, we will definitely. I feel that we're, we will be successful there. All right, just between you and me, what are the chances of anything passing this year? This year, I think when it comes to energy, I think it's going to be great. This is an election year, so. <laughs> okay, yeah, there you go. All right, Elliot, yes. thank you. Our next question is for Professor Dickerson. Let's bring Professor Dickerson in. Uh, Professor, explain the priorities of the Department of Environment's Commission on Climate Change, if you will. Sure, be happy to do that. And then uh, maybe I can relate those to environmental justice. Uh, it looks like we got rid of the echo problem. <clears throat> so the Climate Change Commission uh, is helping the Maryland Department of the Environment. Uh, the goal is uh, now we think 50% reduction relative to 2006 in greenhouse gas emissions by the year 2030. So <clears throat> what we're focusing on uh, is carbon dioxide that just comes from fossil fuels, some uh, fancy chemicals, hydrochlorofluorocarbons uh, that are being eliminated, that will help, and methane. Now, methane is interesting because it has uh, biological as well as fossil fuel sources. What the the priorities are not yet are nitrous oxide, um, which is from agriculture, uh, and we have not yet attacked black carbon. And black carbon is particularly important because not only is it a greenhouse forcing substance, but it's quite toxic. Think of diesel exhaust or soot. So uh, the priorities have been to provide the science uh, and much of the progress has been made by converting coal fired power plants to natural gas. The natural gas is better, but it's still not the solution yet. We have to go to renewables. That would be wind, solar. Nuclear has to be on the table. Uh, for reducing our climate footprint, landfills are uh, low-hanging fruit with very modest expense uh, in the way you manage municipal waste. The amount of methane that comes out of landfills can be reduced substantially and improve the local environment as well as our impact on, uh, on the globe. In terms of environmental justice, uh, <clears throat> there are a lot of things we can do. Planting trees in urban areas is a great idea that helps reduce the urban heat island effect, sequesters uh, carbon as well. And uh, I will, point out that in addition to the societal issues associated with environmental justice, there are technical issues. The, uh, the criteria pollutants established by the EPA are mostly, <clears throat> these goals have been met with the exception of ozone and fine particulate matter. And these two problems tend to be regional in nature. And so regional approaches have been applied and they've, they've been successful but that doesn't really fix the problem at the neighborhood level. Uh, it is of course beyond technical capability to measure everything everywhere all the time. Remote sensing from satellites and numerical models do not have the resolution to get down to every neighborhood yet. So what can we do? Well, you can use low cost sensors and community outreach. And uh, EPA actually has a call for proposals. We're going to try to do that, reach into some of these neighborhoods. These are sensors that cost $100 as opposed to $10,000 or $100,000 each. And uh, it's, it is a big challenge, but I think it's time we met that challenge. And it's going to require some legislation as well. The PM standard is just for total mass. We need to look at the individual specific components that cause morbidity and mortality. Those standards need to be tightened and we need to make measurements at a, a high resolution. We can do other things like drive-by 
in mobile laboratories. We have a small uh, instrumented aircraft that we use to fly around the Baltimore, Washington area to look for hot spots. So we're, we're addressing this problem and it's going to require both technical and legal solutions. So, thank you. Professor, you know, I'm fascinated. Let me ask you, when did you know this was what you wanted to do in life? What was it? What <laughs> was the, how did you, for a lot of us, you know, it only popped up 10, 20 years ago, but how did you know this was what you wanted to do? Well, I've always liked science um, and math, and uh, I'm a child of the 60s, so the, uh, the environmental revolution. Uh, I read Rachel Carson's book when I was a young man and was very moved by that. Uh, you probably lost it in the echo, but one of the things she said is that uh, mankind cannot even recognize demons of his own making. And uh, I, I decided that it, it, rather than invent rust inhibitors, I would try to apply the chemistry and physics that I learned to solving the problems of mankind. Um, it's been very rewarding. It's, uh, uh, I enjoy it a lot. Um, as I said, I'm an employee of the, uni of the state of Maryland. Now, you, you cannot become a tenured professor by being the world's greatest expert on air quality of Baltimore. But after you're tenured, uh, I, I think it's time to give back to the community. So we've been trying to do that. Great job. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. All right, let's bring in Ms. Clark. Ms. Clark with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. Uh, the Chesapeake Bay is our symbol of Maryland. It's what makes us feel better. It's what brings us on the weekend or when we cross the Bay Bridge, we look at the beauty. Tell me, tell me what are the most pressing challenges facing the Chesapeake Bay today? Absolutely. Thanks so much for the, for the question. So since 2010, we've been working towards the Chesapeake Bay blueprint. Um, the blueprint timeline would come due in 2025. So we're nearing the end with less than four years to go. And we have made tremendous progress across the whole watershed. We've reduced nitrogen pollution, for example, one of the main pollutants we're tracking by 44%. But that was over an 11 year time span. And now we're looking at, at finishing out the job, more than half of the nitrogen, for example, pollution in the next four years. So it's gonna take, take a tremendous effort and dedication um, toward the plans that have been crafted in particular in Maryland there'll be a lot of emphasis on the agricultural sector and how we can reduce pollution in order to meet the goals of our state's watershed implementation plan. Right. Climate, you know, climate change has come up a lot. If I could continue, sure. climate is absolutely one of the most pressing challenges also facing the Bay. It's making the Bay's cleanup tougher. Um, one of the ways that it makes it tougher, you know, you heard reference to tree plantings in, in developed areas and in, in our cities and towns having a cooling effect. Well, they also have a wonderful water quality effect. They help to suck up rainfall, which we're seeing in exacerbated amounts due to climate change. We're seeing more frequent rainstorms, more severe rainstorms, more overall volume of rain. And what can we do to try to mitigate the flooding that folks are facing now in our, in our cities and towns and even suburban areas, one of the ways would be to plant trees and it's also a way to help address the bay cleanup. We need to focus on those rainfall runoff solutions in order to have an equitable approach to the bay cleanup. You won't only be cleaning up the main stem of the bay, you'll also be filtering water to streams and rivers near where people live. Um, the other area that we need to be attentive towards has been an area of tremendous investment by the General Assembly and the state of Maryland, and that is in cleaning up our wastewater treatment plants. But now we've got to make sure that that money we've invested is actually performing by, by requiring maintenance and enforcement of the, of the permits that our wastewater treatment plants are operating under. So we're working very hard this legislative session to bring attention to rainfall runoff from industrial sites and, and pollution from wastewater treatment plants and making sure that, that those industries that are operating, frankly, clustered in some of our most developed areas, clustered around the Baltimore City, um, 
Prince George's County near the District of Columbia, Northern Anne Arundel County, Salisbury, Maryland, um, and wastewater treatment plants are really adhering to their, to their permit limits and not emitting too much pollution. All right, thank you so much. Very good stuff. And uh, we want to bring in uh, Chris right now. This is fascinating, your business here. 1990 has started. And just explain the, the construction practices and identifying and fulfilling the mission that you, you have set forth here for your company. So I, I, it's a great question, and, and I wish I actually had an easier answer for it. Our mission is a tough one, um, and I'm losing hair every day uh, because of our, our mission. Um, you know, I might end up being as white as Professor Dickerson when we do this ne next, uh, next year. But it's something we chose. It's something, you know, I was, I was born in 1989. Uh, but Keith Underwood, my partner, has, like as you mentioned, has uh, been doing it since 1990. And he really spearheaded, not just in our area, but up, up and down the Mid-Atlantic, this whole idea of ecosystem recovery. And how do we truly restore our ecosystems? And that was from a passion of his just within ecosystems. It was before... As Ms. Clark uh, mentioned, the, the Chesapeake Bay TMDL, the blueprint, it was before the climate adaptation plans. It was before all of that. He, he was just interested in restoring these rare and endangered species. So we have a bit of a, a, a jump start on, on ecosystem services and benefits. So that's a good part. The bad part, the part that's making me lose my hair or make it turn white is it's not that easy. Um, you know, it'd be it, it, and easy as in everything, but being a traditional construction company, even in uh, in, in the environmental field, is uh, you you do what's given uh, and and you work on the status quo. Our business is we're constantly trying to evolve and do the right thing uh, for the environment and for the people who live here. So working with legislation, working with folks uh, at the University of Maryland Chesapeake Bay Foundation to really do what's right. And we have to learn every step of the way. Uh, you know, the, the type of practices that we're doing now uh, in the field are different than when Keith started 30 years ago. Now the, the bones are the same, thinking about regenerative ecosystems, thinking about carbon sequestration and how do we get the most benefit for our, our buck uh, are still there. But where we're doing this work, where we're focusing it, uh, the environmental justice issues that have been brought up several times here are really important to us. Um, you know, it's a big elephant, this whole Chesapeake Bay cleanup effort. And you just got to take one bite at a time. And we're a small group, uh, but we, we spread our services around. Um, we're trying to work in Baltimore City just as much as we're working in rural agriculture on the Eastern Shore. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a good path. It's a difficult one, uh, but it's important. Um, I think most importantly, with the work that we do, it's our partners that are helping us get through it. You know, working with faith-based organization, landowners, people who have the same ethos as us as far as wanting to be good stewards to their land, that's what really makes our job more effective. We can come in and, and put in our principles, our design-build principles uh, on, you know, big properties, uh, big, big community spaces, so that not just one individual property owner can benefit from it, but a church or community can benefit from that ecosystem restoration project. Um, that's where we are. And, and luckily being in the Chesapeake Bay watershed, we're very progressive here, uh, more so than other parks in the country. And uh, kind of the last part of our goal and our commitment to all this is to keep Maryland that national leadership. We're constantly going around presenting, uh, going overseas presenting, and letting people know that, you know, the science coming out of University of Maryland, the policy coming from Chesapeake Bay Foundation, the designs coming from Underwood and Associates, these are really, you know, global water quality, hab habitat creation, uh, um, climate adaptation projects. And we need to be rem reminded of that and continue to move forward. Give me the one project that you are most proud of that you can share with us tonight. What's that Dude. one project that, man, look at this, look what we did. Oh man, that's tough. I think, I think probably what I'll say is uh, there's a project, not just because, well, actually it's an Episcopal church. So I don't know if I'm allowed to, to say that, but uh, it's a project, uh, uh, St. Luke's Episcopal church right in Eastport. Uh, if you guys are in Annapolis, uh, swing by. It's a, it's a project that took uh, a, pro a church property and we worked with that church 
that said, look, we really want to transform our property. We want to take stormwater that's been polluting the community's creek for years, ever since the area has been developed. And we want to take that on our property. And what the church did was they gave up a big ball field, a big grass turf area in the city, you know, in Eastport. And they gave up a big uh, kind of urban forest area. And they took the, all the community's stormwater out of, that, out of the uh, stormwater system and they put it on their landscape. And they really created a park around it. Uh, and we were able to work with the church, work with the city, uh, work with the Department of Natural Resources to get the project funded. And, you know, driving by, taking my kids by there on the weekend, seeing people walk across and use and walk their dogs on a stormwater management climate resiliency project without even knowing it or understanding it is a beautiful thing. Uh, and that's right here in Annapolis. So that might be it. But if other project partners are listening, uh, might be a little upset, but I think that's that, it. That's all right, Chris. Thank you. They'll, they'll treat you to something at Davis's later. That's great. All right, let's go to Archbishop Lori. Archbishop, you have been outspoken on this, but th what I like about it is that you take a worldwide issue that's hard to understand and you break it down to the locals so that why should we hear locally? Why should we pay attention to what's going on around us? Explain that. Sure. Well, you know, um, Pope Francis is the first to have written an encyclical on the environment, Laudato Si, but um, he's not the first Pope or the first um, instance of church teaching on care for creation. This has really always been a part of the church's understanding. The creation is God's gift to us. It's good, it's beautiful, and we are not its owners or its masters but rather it's, it's stewards. And that has to be applied uh, locally. That has to be applied. If it doesn't happen locally, it's not happening. It's just a thought. It's just a nice idea. And um, the church itself um, has a lot of property and so has an obligation, I think, to... Um, to follow its own teaching in the first instance. And secondly, um, our churches and schools are part and parcel of neighborhoods. And so we have to be very conscious of what's happening in neighborhoods and what happens to the people living in those neighborhoods when there is environmental degradation and when those who are um, underserved, when those who have suffered lack of privilege find themselves um, uh, enmeshed in that, it is incumbent upon the church to not only to speak about it, but uh, to do something about it. And a lot of that involves uh, the kinds of charities, the, the social services that the church provides, educational opportunity, uh, paths to economic opportunity, and indeed, um, being a good steward in the neighborhoods where our churches uh, exist. So the Pope has given us a grand vision and uh, either it's gonna um, exist and live in our most challenged neighborhoods or it's not, it's not going to exist at all. So I think that this is a very big part of the church's mission. We also have to uh, team up with listen to dialogue with the scientific community. This is not merely a theological issue. It is a theological issue for us, but it is also uh, an issue for our human ingenuity. And the church is a believer, a defender, a lover of reason. And so I think that, uh, um, that the church recognizes also its role to be a partner with the scientific community and a partner with our legislators in achieving uh, good legislation that's gonna help people on the ground. All right, well, that brings us back to Senator Carter. Uh, Senator, uh, you, you have to admit the lead poisoning in Baltimore. I mean, that was on everybody's mind for, the la for almost half a century and still is, but how do you keep the General Assembly's eye on the focus of combating lead poisoning. 
water quality, leaking sewage and air toxins. How do you keep the lawmaker's eye on the ball? Well, thank you for the question. Well, certainly if I knew that, we would already accomplish these goals and fix this horrific problem. Um, you know, for many years, I sponsored the market share liability legislation and, you know, it's still an important issue, but the legislature um, has not been willing to grapple with that issue to hold paint companies liable. Station and destruction that they've caused to generations of, of young people and families. So that's something I'd put a, a request out to everyone to, to keep it on your radar. Um, that's something that is still needs to be addressed. Um, but we do have, that's a bad note. That's something that we really bear um, shame for not fixing up until now. But there's some good pieces of legislation this year, real quick, that I'd like to speak about. Um, one is Senate Bill 783, which guarantees a constitutional right to environmental health. Um, another is Senate Bill 471, which basically guarantees that our, colleague, our colleges and universities achieve carbon neutrality. Um, and of course, the bill that was the bill of the day, which was Senate Bill 528. Um, and that will be really important to ensure that we're creating clean energy jobs for black and brown communities. And that'll be something that we can do to ensure equity in our future. And then finally, we've got House Bill 363 sponsored by Delegate Sheila Ruth. And that bill would empower the attorney general to sue fossil fuel companies who are polluting the air. And that's kind of akin to the legislation that we need to pass to go after the, late, the lead paint companies as well. Um, and so there is hope on the horizon. And I wanna just end that by giving a shout out to the groups and organizations that have been fighting these fights for years. And the legislature needs to listen to the young people and the people that are committed to this effort. Young people like Destiny Watford, um, the Sunrise Organization, Mary Perg, the Campaign for Environmental and Human Rights, Fight Blight Baltimore, and Black Yield Institute. They've been speaking truth to these issues for years. And what we need to do as a legislative body is follow their lead. All right, Senator, thank you. Delegate Brooks, let me bring you in here. Uh, you got a big smile on your face because you know <laughs> you're doing the job yeah. down there. You supported legislation that that moves this state toward 100% clean energy usage and fossil fuel independence. Will we have independence one day? Uh, Jamie, thanks for the question. And I, I certainly do believe that, you know, um, we uh, here again, I, as I mentioned earlier, Maryland has been a leader, you know, when we came up with the CJ, it's a clean energy job at, jobs act and where we wanted to get 50% of our electricity coming from renewable sources. Not clean energy, but renewable sources, you know, and to make the distinction between uh, uh, clean energy and renewable energy. Of course, we know that nuclear energy would be considered clean energy, but renewable energy would energies that are coming from a source to where where it regenerates itself uh, every year. Um, but uh, but but I think we can get there. You know, I, I think with the um, with the attitude, and of course with all of the environmentalists who keep pushing us. Sometimes we think that they're pushing us a bit hard, but hey, that's what they should do. I, I, I think we can, can make those accomplishments. You know, uh, Oftentimes I, I think back about the, um, the solar and the wind. And of course, right now we, we need a base load and we just don't have that capacity in those two uh, energies to, to give us that base load. But until we get there, and as a, a, a uh, Dr. Nickerson said, you know, uh, you know, some, you know, just to be realistic, you know, uh, uh, nuclear is in that is in that mix, you know, for right now. But maybe one day we can get to the point where we get beyond that. But for right now, that's definitely part of part of that mix. And um, but uh, but I think giving incentives, and oftentimes I, I tell folks, you know, the things that get us motivated or get the, the public motivated is incentive incentives like what we did with the ITC. That was the investment tax credit. That's when the federal government was giving a 30% write-off on the cost of whatever that project was. Baltimore County, my county, would give a $5,000 credit toward property taxes. And then the state was given a grant for 1000 So you take a, a $20,000 project with solar panels. 
your actual cost was eight thousand dollars after the write-offs. You know, so those type incentives are, are enough to get people motivated, and would, would definitely continue to propel us in the, in the right direction. So, to answer your question, yes, I think I think we can do it. Oh, we will. I'm sorry you were breaking up, Jamie, if that was another question. Um, about license plates, because making inroads in some of the laws, do you see some of the laws the General Assembly can address the challenges facing the Bay? What, are, you, are you pleased with what you're seeing in Annapolis now? Well, yeah, we, um, I, th I think we're, we're moving in the right direction albeit perhaps maybe at a slower pace than some would like to see us move, you know? But, you know, progress sometimes can be slow, but as long as it is effective, and that's what we strive for, you know, the effectiveness of it, you know? And sometimes we, got, we pull some legislators along, screaming and kicking, you know? But the, the, at the end of the day, as long as we get them there, uh, we won't... Uh, give up. And, I, and I'll take a phrase from what my father used to say. He's a son. I might give out, but up, never. So that was his attitude. So that, that's going to be my attitude as long as I'm in the legislature. Well, that's what the the, the uh, Chesapeake Bay Foundation, they, uh, they are pushing for laws that, that protect our bay. We've gone out and bought license plates with Save Our Bay. Uh, Miss Clark, how do you think the legislative efforts are going on in Annapolis? I know you pay attention every single moment of your waking hours. Are you happy with what you're seeing? Well, you know, the jury's out for this year, but we have seen a tremendous number of, of good bills come in. Um, we'll also be playing defense to a certain extent this year. Last year, we had an enormous success in passing a five million tree planting goal for the state of Maryland, um, including 500,000 trees to go into urban areas in Maryland um, to address uh, rainwater runoff and help with climate too. Um, Senator Carter mentioned all different levels of government, the need for vigilance at the state level, at the local level, at the regulatory level. Um, these are all elements of the system, but at the state level, we feel inspired that the state can be a leader and pulling those other, um, those other elements of government, the, our, our sister governments at the local level along. And we hope to see that not only in tree planting, but also in forest conservation. Probably not the focus this year, but coming up, we'll have to address forest conservation in order to preserve that resource that we need for water quality and also for climate. So I'm very hopeful um, that the state can, can be a leader um, and direct us uh, toward those positive ends for the Bay and for the climate. Mr. Beecraft, uh, tell me, you're, the, you're in way ahead of everybody as far as companies and groups are concerned. How do you get more groups and companies to follow your lead? I think I'm just gonna quote uh, Delegate Brooks. I think he said it best was environmental environmental groups are, are pushing hard, but he, he thinks that's uh, what they're there to do. And I think that's what we're here to do uh, at Underwood and Associates, where we know that there's a right way to build. We know that there's a right way to design these projects to meet you know, all the goals that everybody have mentioned today. We just have to keep pushing to, to make sure it's done right. Um, we, we can develop smart. There's no reason why development has to be a bad thing for the Bay. We can, we can farm smart. Agriculture doesn't have to be a bad thing for the Bay. Uh, we just have to use what we know and what's understood now and truly implement it um, and just continue to push companies to do the right thing. Uh, Keith, the uh, last thing I'll mention is Keith Underwood, um, my partner has always said there's only one way to do it and it's the right way. And that, that really uh, it, it holds true with regards to ecosystem restoration. There's only one way to be, build an ecosystem uh, the right way. All right, thank you so much, Chris. Let's go to Archbishop Lori. Just what we've heard here tonight, how does this, implore the dignity of life everything we've heard well i think what everybody um, has said in essence is that uh, that the world the environment that we have is a great and beautiful thing um, it is really god's gift to us 
and our lives, our dignity, that's God's gift as well. And the two come together because the earth is the home for human beings. And if we respect human beings, especially the poorest and those who are vulnerable, we will respect and care for the environment, both are God's gifts, and we should be grateful and give praise to God for them, just like St. Francis of Assisi did. Good. Well, we'd like to thank all the panelists here. Senator, Delegate Chris, he did a great job. Rob, Professor, you're outstanding. Archbishop, another outstanding job, and we'll We'll shut this all down with a prayer to make our minds and hearts go to bed a little easier. All right, thank you. All powerful God, you are present in the whole universe and in the smallest of your creatures. You embrace with your tenderness all that exists. Pour out upon us the power of your love that we may protect life and beauty. Fill us with peace that we may live as brothers and sisters, harming no one. O God of the poor, help us to rescue the abandoned and forgotten of this earth, so precious in your eyes. Bring healing to our lives that we may protect the world and not prey on it, that we may sow beauty, not pollution and destruction. Touch the hearts of those who look only for gain at the expense of the poor and the earth. Teach us to discover the worth of each thing, to be filled with awe and contemplation, to recognize that we are profoundly united with every creature as we journey towards your infinite light. We thank you for being with us each day. Encourage us, we pray, in our struggle for justice, love, and peace. Amen. Amen. On behalf of the Maryland Catholic Conference, we thank you so much for joining us here tonight. You panelists were outstanding. You ought to take this on the road. They pay handsomely for what you're answering here tonight. Thank you so much. Keep up the great work and make sure that everybody knows we got to take care of our place where we are. Thank you so much, everybody. That concludes our discussion here tonight. Thank you all who participated and attended this event, which can be viewed along with the previous town hall meetings on the website of the Maryland Catholic Conference, mdcatholic.org. Thank you, everybody, and good night. Good night, Jamie. Thank you. Good night.